for joining us tonight. I really want to thank Meredith for always doing and making this really nice, elaborate introduction that are at the same time humbling but extremely flattering. So I really, I really appreciate. So tonight I'm, I'm going to um, speak about a topic that's actually quite new to me, but I thought it was a lot more relevant to humanity. Um, population is how we can, or we may, or we may not, be able to actually predict earthquakes. And if you fly to Los Angeles or San Francisco and you have your laptop open and you show seismogram, everybody will ask you, can you really predict earthquake? When is the next big one? And every time we tend to, you know, we have to say carefully that we probably cannot predict earthquake because um, we can have liability issues in, in, uh, in saying wrong things. But I'm actually not losing hope. Um, recently, We've, we've harnessed so much data, and we're making more observation that I'm actually, I, I think that one day we'll be able to do so, but I wanted to uh, go with you and show you what are the time scales involved and, and where it actually matters. And so, uh, this is a quite old photo, it's taken after the 1906 earthquake. Uh, uh, it's a fault that ran through the city of San Francisco. So that image that you see here, of course, it's older constructions, uh, it was very dramatic. Um, most of it was due to the fire that started after the earthquake. So earthquakes should generate a lot more hazards that are just um, you know, coming out after that. Um, the other type of, when we think about earthquakes, we think about this previous photo and what we see here, it's mostly damage that is sudden right after the earthquake. It's people dying, it's building collapse, it's highway collapse as you mentioned. And uh, these are iconical figures of what earthquakes um, are. What I also want to point out, it's not necessarily the casualties that we refer to, but it's also the great economic loss that are uh, accompanied with these earthquakes. Um, some countries have really a lot of trouble recovering from those, such as Haiti in um, 2010, uh, Japan in 1994, and in 2011 was hit twice badly. So there's a lot of economic loss due to those earthquakes. Earthquakes are also the way that the Earth has to form landscapes. This is a, a photo from uh, 2010, another big earthquake in Southern California. And you can see here a very nice fault scar um, that's not been eroded yet, and a geologist for scale. And um, if you can see the hills behind, you actually start understanding that earthquakes are the cause of the building of the landscape around us. And I want to zoom out and look at the Earth. And now I can tell you, most of the topography that we see here is due to earthquakes. So what you can see here is the uh, bathymetry and topography map. We are located over there, um, centering around uh, the Pacific Ring, because we have a nice um, um, uh, distribution of seismicity around it. But you can see there's a lot of texture in, in, in this uh, photo. It is just showing you that the Earth is very dynamic. And actually, the earthquakes are a system, a mechanism to deal with this. So the plate tectonics is basically all of these, um, they're not totally rigid, but we can you know, simplify the system as a very rigid plate. They are surrounded by those uh, zones that you can see in the topography quite clear. You can see those zones here. And here, the topography shows you that this is, uh, let's say, the Pacific place. It's surrounded, it's bordered by active faults. And, and the San Andreas Fault being one of them. So we, if you look at the Earth at this scale, you say these are lines. People like to say fault lines. It's not lines, it's a surface, it's a volume. But we can simplify them as, as line, and then we can assume that maybe earthquakes are on it. Earthquakes are indeed mostly located on these lines here. So these are our ridges. This is the San Andreas Fault system. This is Japan. And you can see that globally, you may have distributed seismicity but all those uh, uh, stars are representing where most of the big earthquakes are. So crudely speaking, you, you know that at, at boundaries of plates, you may have earthquakes. Of course, Oklahoma is showing up here, not quite, but, but intra-plates you can have seismicity, but to the first order, if you want to know where earthquakes are, it's usually on, on, on those plates, boundaries. Now if you zoom in to this boundary, it's actually a more diffuse system. These red lines and the black ones are representing mapped faults. And you can see that it's not a line, it's not necessarily straight, it has uh, curvature, it has um, uh, nice delineation, 
the dots here are showing the seismicity that we have that actually seems to correspond to those um, topographic features. So if we want to know where faults are, traditionally what we look at is the past seismicity in these catalogs and look at where seismicity is. So this is San Francisco, and the biggest earthquake was along this fault. And you can see for most of it, there's actually no seismicity at all. So if you rely on these catalogs to know where earthquakes are and, and try to predict it, you are actually missing out a huge part, because here you can have a large earthquake, but you don't have any seismicity to understand it. Uh, so I spent my PhD you know, somewhere over there and I had zero earthquake for, for five and a half years, which is good. <laughs> Um, but uh, studying them, it was, it, was, it was interesting. Faults can be very quiet. So to deal with this, geologists, um, they dig big trenches through faults, and they look at the texture and the composition of the, the minerals and, and rocks, and they try to date those rocks, and then they try to find the history of the faults and um, how many earthquakes there were. So this is an example on, on the Wasatch Fault in Utah, uh, which boards the Salt Lake uh, City to the east. And so if you actually look at those rocks and you make a time history of them, you can find when earthquakes happen. And I'm showing you the best example we have of this. So this is New Zealand. And I don't know if you can tell, but there's some linear feature here. Linear features are not natural. They're really caused by fault. And this is uh, highlighted here, what we call the Alpine Fault. From a French perspective, I was like, these are not the Alps. <laughs> Les Alpes sont en France. But <laughs> New Zealand is like it. Uh, they also make excellent cheese, so they have a good excuse. But so basically, this is the Alpine Fault. It's a quite fast fault. It's also heavily, uh, there's nice, nice topography to it. And if we trench through it, uh, uh, geologists have found a nice series of earthquakes. It's also nice because it's not really populated, so it, it does not cause tremendous damage, so we can use the word nice to think about earthquakes. This is the date of those earthquakes in thousands of years, and you can see this nice regular line here with some kind of distribution of uncertainty of these when these earthquakes happen. So if you look at the interval between each of them, you make those plots here, which look at the recurrence interval between earthquakes, and you see that they're mostly around 300 years. And for all of these 10 to 20 year earthquakes, every 300 years, you may have an earthquake. And so the last one being in the 1700, we're close to the end of the cycle for this earthquake. We think about earthquake cycles here because every 300 years, we can have an earthquake. So bingo, we should be able to predict earthquakes. Of course, I'm not giving you this talk to say yes, we solved it. Many faults do not behave like this. This is a time series here showing the lifelong um, time series of the, the faults. These uh, uh, losanges are showing you uh, when earthquakes happen. These are several faults. This is the Alpine Fault. You see that beautiful time series of periodic earthquakes. And then you look at the San Andreas Fault and the system is actually absolutely not regular. It has these weird clusters of seismicity, the Dead Sea Transform Fault has some, somewhat of a regular interval, but not at all, and the Dead Sea, uh, this, this one is actually showing clusters of events. So the predictability here is, is, is not strong because we have clustering of events and we can't even control those clusters. So what happened on a fault, um, we think about earthquake cycles because an earthquake happens, it heals, it's in between cycles and it hit again, and it's supposed to be periodic. Scientists today do not really like the word cycle because of this irregularity in some of the, um, the fault systems. Um, but I'd like to just um, emphasize that it's just a very, if we think about a very simple model, you can think about this model where you have uh, a spring and a, and a handle, you have a surface that could be rough or, or smooth as you wish, and then you have a block, and you pull it. And so if you have elasticity in your string here, the block is not going to move as you pull until it's too tensed, and then the block will slide toward you. And so this effect of increasing the stress loading on the string, and then slip, and it sticks, and it slips, and so on and so forth, is the fundamental view of earthquake cycles. 
where you increase the force, the plates are moving at a somewhat regular uh, pace, and then it, it's locked, it sticks, and then it slips through an earthquake, and so on and so forth. So if we model forces in the Earth, you can say it's a constant forcing, constant slip, constant forcing, constant slip. This is the ideal case. We have in the United States one fault that seems to behave like this. Um, it's, it's, in the park, it's in San Andreas Fault in the Parkfield area. And it was so regular in the past, these are years of, of occurrence of these earthquakes, every 20 plus years, there was a little magnitude six that would occur on this fault. So this is the earthquake series, and you can look at number of earthquakes and time, you draw a line, and you predict when the next earthquake will go. So the prediction was that between 1987 and 1983, we should have an earthquake. So the USGS deployed a lot of resources around Park Field to instrument the fault and to capture the full cycle. But the earthquake did not happen. And I think a lot of seismologists completely lost faith because it took many more years for the earthquake to actually occur. And so I think there was, um, when big events like this, um, either like the Hoku or all these events where we don't expect them to happen, it's very hard for seismologists to react. Um, and so I think because of that, a lot of the seismology has been going away from prediction. It was all about prediction before, this has failed, let's move on and not predict earthquake anymore. So let's think about this time series that I was just uh, drawing you. We have the earthquake at time zero, we have what happens before or in between earthquakes, and then we have what happens after. So here I'm showing you that between years to months to second before the earthquake, this is the phase that we call a nucleation phase. We are at the end of the earthquake cycle. Something is happening. We will have an earthquake. We just don't know when T0 is. Um, what happens after is the earthquake ruptures. It's not, a instant, like, it's not a snap like this. It takes some time. So we have a few seconds to tens of seconds, during which and after which a lot of shaking the ground motion goes, and that's why it destroys the building. So, the prediction of earthquakes within years, I'm a little bit skeptical today. Um, and I would say that probably we may not be able to do that anytime soon, mostly because we don't have that many years in our records. But let's look at uh, nucleation. What happens between months and seconds before the earthquake? Unfortunately, all of these precursory phases are seen or detected after the earthquake. Uh, so, so far we have seen those phases but it's always after going back to looking at the data. So um, in 2011, March 2011, uh, magnitude 9.0 in Japan, this is a map of Japan. This plot is showing you with colors the amount of slip on a fault surface. It's, it's, it's dipping like this. And the contours are showing you where the slip during the Tohoku event happened. So basically in the middle, that's where you had about 50 meters of slip and then nothing in between. And these colors are showing what happened before the earthquake. And so using data on shore, scientists have been able to look at how much slip, very slow slip, happened years before the earthquake. Um, this, this line here, this, this time series, is showing you what a GPS would record as a function of years. So you can see we, we don't have that many, you know, we have maybe a few decades of earthquake. Of, of data, but not that much more. And if you re-remove some of the effects, you can see that there is this non-constant but accelerating phase of displacement, and this is mapped into the fall. And so we have this acceleration of slip. It's very slow and steady, but it grows, uh, and we can detect it by looking at years of data. It's, all, it's very often afterwards that we, that we notice this. If you look at the four shocks, Four shocks are earthquakes that happened before the earthquake, the main, the main shock. Four shocks are only called four shocks after the main shock. So it's hard to use them as a prediction. Um, what I'm showing you here is three earthquakes that happened uh, in Southern California. This is the El Mayer Cucapa earthquake in 2010. I had sensors actually nearby. Um, and uh, my husband actually was on the, G on the road with GPS deploying sensors at the same time. Uh, these are two earthquakes in the 90s uh, that happened on the eastern uh, shore zone in California. These are showing you the magnitude 
with time of the earthquakes, the black ones are obviously the aftershocks because they happen after the main shock shown with this uh, cross, and the red ones are the foreshocks. Do you see any pattern? No, there are some earthquakes, but are they foreshocks, aftershocks of the previous earthquakes? We don't know. So these are kind of the observations. In the lab, though, if you were to make earthquake in the lab, the system is a lot more predictable. And so uh, these lab quakes, uh, they win every time. I'll show you um, at the end. We have a nice uh, plot on this. These lab quakes behave so nicely. They behave like the model, not like the Earth, apparently. But these lab quakes are showing you the onset of seismicity. You can see those dots, same kind of style here are getting more and more frequent as we go uh, right before the earthquake. And this is just showing you kind of an acceleration of the slip on the earthquakes. So in the lab, they behave like what we want them to be. In nature, it's just not, it's not there yet. And there are two debated models for how earthquakes start. Uh, and I, I, no one, I think, has clearly stated this is the one model. I think it's probably, as always, a combination of both. These are the um, cascade model, where you have a bunch of pops on the fault. They all pop and trigger each other, and then eventually it becomes a big one. In which case, it's very hard to say which one is going to trigger the last one. Or you can have this one, which is uh, kind of a, a slow growth a seismic slip, which accelerates and then becomes a big one. And this is rarely observed, unlike this one but it's, it's a lot more consistent with models and lab experiments. And so there were many papers this summer that discussed these two models, and we, cannot, you know, we don't have the data resolution to actually validate those two. But this is the grail of earthquake prediction. If you could actually see those eventually and, and classify them as precursor, then maybe you would be able to be before the earthquake. So I would say that what happened in the nucleation, I think maybe, we rarely observe them, usually for large earthquakes, but we've seen some observe. We have observed some, so I think looking back at the data, we may have hope to study those phases a lot more. So now the user, the person, you know, the surgeon, uh, the eye surgeon with his laser, is saying, "When should I, you know, stop the laser? <laughs> when is the shaking coming if there is an earthquake?" And so I'm, 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 I'm not skipping this phase. I'm just saying. Who cares about when the earthquake happened? I really care just about the shaking and how much shaking. And this, is, this becomes actually a different side of seismology, which is very much oriented toward operation and user and, and you know, what matters for people is really just the amount of shaking, whatever earthquake style we have. So, so if these are your science question, then we can, do, we can look at other things. So I want to focus uh, the rest of this discussion on what happened during the rupture and right after, and, and how can we help the early warning uh, of this shaking. And this is, um, I'm, I'm an amateur at this, but I wanted to show you briefly what the system of the earthquake early warning is about. And I, I heard today that the funding will be um, continued, which is nice when you already spend 20 million dollars, to uh, have finally an official uh, earthquake early warning system in the United States. Mexico has one since the 90s. Um, so we're developing, um, sci you know, scientists are developing one in, uh, in California and mostly the West Coast in general. And, and the system is as such. Phones and, and internet is faster, propagates faster than seismic waves. That's where you win. That's basically it. If you have an earthquake that happens on a fault, some waves will propagate. The first one, the yellow one, the first one is not the most damaging, but it carries a lot of information. So what you want is having sensors close by this, uh, the epicenter. Then you have want to say, well, this is an earthquake and not a car driving by, so you may need a few sensors for this. But then the information is no longer sent with seismic waves, but with phones and, um, and communication like this. So then the data gets into the earthquake alert center, and then there's a decision-making module which says this will be the size of the earthquake, therefore this will be the shaking, should we alert, yes, no. All of these modules are quite complicated and elaborated, and then it gets to the people. And, and there are apps you can have it on your phone that will tell you 
the level of shaking of intensity of such will arrive at x seconds, or in x seconds. So the basis for the earthquake early warning, it's not to say we, the earthquake will happen, it's to say an earthquake has happened, now the shaking will happen at, in such time. So you can already see that the further you, away you are from the fault, the greater advanced knowledge you may have. If you're very close to the fault, you may not have a second of warning. So there's not even a point, almost, of having warning. Although I'd like to say that that one second, and I always think about this eye surgeon with the laser in your eye, and maybe that one second will just shut off the laser, and that might actually save your eye. So even one second is important. In Japan, in the, um, in the nuclear power plant, they have seismometers three kilometers down, and this three kilometers down with a three kilometers per second you know, wave speed gives you one second warning is sufficient to shut down the, uh, the operations. So, so even those you know, few seconds matter. Um, but for the, the, the person, you and I, you know, or you, Meredith, next week, sorry, uh, you, might need, you might want some level of warning. And so a lot of the questions have been, if the earthquake just happened, it may last tens of seconds, maybe 30, 70 seconds. As soon as the earthquake happened, I want to know how big it is. I want to know how much shaking it is. Because the longer we wait for that warning, the less warning we'll have. And so a lot of the questions have been both in the, you know, uh, the, the use of it for earthquake early warning, but in terms of physics of earthquakes, is this beginning pulse, this beginning onset, will carry the information of the size of the event. Another way to say this is, um, we call that the determinism in earthquakes. Is the beginning of the earthquake carries enough information that we know what the end of the earthquake is going to be like, therefore we can tell what magnitude, therefore we can tell what type of shaking. Um, and so a lot of the questions are, there's a lot of skepticism, and, you know, again, related to this park field, failed experiment about earthquake determinism. And so in publications, I, you know, I was I recommended to not use this term. It's politically not correct. Uh, but all it says is, is there any information at the beginning that tell us the evolution of the earthquake? And so it's, it's, it's just a word, and I think there are sides to it, and I'm showing the, you the both sides. Um, I will take one side. We'll see at the end of this talk. But basically, there are two camps. That's why we have debates. There are the camp that say, yes, earthquakes are deterministic. If we look at the onset of earthquakes, I know what the final size of the earthquake will be before it even ends. And then you have the no camp, which says, look, all, all earthquakes look, they start the same way. And I'll explain those plots. But, but the bottom line is that we have different data, different way to process it, different school of thinking, those are probably the same earthquakes, and we're just, we're too, we're not coordinated enough to be very systematic yet in our approaches to analyze the data in a very objective way. Uh, so on this camp, these are plots that show uh, time of the earthquake through some normalization. This is a in log scale of the peak ground displacement. And the blue, the colors are showing you the, the magnitude of the earthquake. And basically, you see that the way the displacement grows with time is not the same for magnitude 9 or magnitude 4. On the say, this is a 2014 study. They said, you know, small earthquakes start faster than big earthquakes. Um, this study actually shows the opposite. So I'm not sure, you know, the validity of this, but still, like, it's about this growth. Uh, basically. These, um, this group shows that in log log, by the way, in, in, in earth science, we have so many scales that we put everything in log time, special scales. Uh, we, we like to collapse things into this log log scale. So this is um, the log of the peak ground displacement in meters. This is the log since the P wave started. And so you can see these are binned with earthquake magnitudes. Um, we have a lot of, I, I don't think we're really good at statistics, to be honest, because we think that everything is log normal. So we take median and means, and we try to respect this, but it's not necessarily um, robust. 
Nonetheless, if we take the median of these uh, curves of P waves, which are the first waves that arrive, you can see that the beginning, whatever the magnitude you are at, the count of locals is the same. But this is one data set, this is one team, these guys are saying, I'm using another data, I don't see this, and debate goes on and on and on. And so I, it, it's, it's really interesting to think about there's a lot of diversity in earthquake, and so really how should we study them? We have this, all these scales and length scales and temporal scales, and so I think we are, uh, we're not really fully integrated yet, but I think there's hope um, to do that. Um, I'm not yet fully integrated. But you know, I, I'm just raising the question that I think eventually we should think about um, all those scales. And so, um, pardon for the lack of resolution here, there's one way to do it, which is the camp that I just showed you earlier, is you say, I have all these diverse earthquakes, I'm just going to stack them together, I'm going to look at the average earthquakes. And I was telling you, everything is about log normal, so what we do is a lot about combining those messages and then uh, trying to make this average view of the earthquake. And so if you actually take this medians and median bin on all these earthquake magnitude, this is time, this is kind of like what the P wave would look like. Um, these people found a triangle function that makes it to science right away. Triangles are weird in earthquakes. Everything should be log normal and should not have any kinks. But what they saw is if we average everything over everything, then it looks like the same. So that's saying there's just a common behavior of earthquakes. Uh, I showed in, uh, in some of my work that if I do the same, there's some differences, but they're only related to earthquake depth, not earthquake sizes. So in terms of predicting magnitude, you're kind of out of luck. So that's one side. You can, it's strategy for science of saying, take all the earthquakes, average everything, find the commonality between earthquakes, simplify the system as much as possible. Or you can embrace the complexity. Earthquakes are so different from one another. And I was telling you, it's log normal. So there's a lot of differences at all scales. So this is just showing you a little snippet of what data sets we're working on, is how different earthquakes look like. And if they are so different, why can't we say about it? Is there any way we can predict earthquakes or the size of the earthquake if they all look different. Um, another example, we got thousands and thousands of those functions that look like earthquakes, but really, they, are, they vary a lot. So um, part of the research that I um, started doing this, this summer with a really, really good team of students, I was so fortunate, um, I really love working with students who have no a priori on seismology whatsoever and start asking these questions that are so fundamental without having the history and the package of what they should not be saying determinism. So, so this student was really, you know, very creative, not stubborn, but, you know, very determined in solving the problem um, and actually found, found a really interesting pattern in the complexity of earthquakes. So it's, it was no longer about let's simplify everything into averaging everything. He said, let's look at this complexity, embrace it, and find patterns. And so I will summarize it in such. We have an earthquake here. It's a big earthquake, uh, probably of magnitude 7.5, maybe 8 given the duration here, 60 seconds of duration. This function could be like a P wave, so you could see that in a seismometer. I'm happy to talk more details about that later. And I'm showing you two types of earthquakes. We have the big one in orange, the small one in uh, turquoise, teal, beautiful color scheme. Um, and they, they look different, right? So one is really complex, lots of bumps. They're not this simple triangle function. If you look at individual earthquakes, there's a lot of richness in it. Um, and then the small one has one bump. And so he basically said, let's count the bumps. And he made bumps with Gaussian functions, log normal, we love it, and decomposed these functions by just adding and summing all of these log functions and counting them as what we call sub-events. They are not a full earthquake, they're just a, a small earthquake that belongs, a small event that belongs to that big earthquake. And so it seems like large earthquakes have a lot of bumps, sub-events, and small earthquakes have fewer bumps. 
well, let's see, increase complexity with earthquake size, which is not that, uh, somewhat that surprising. What was interesting is we could model this very simply in-house with simple fracture mechanics models um, where we created earthquakes on, with a set of parameters I can explain later. But basically what we found is the big earthquakes have a lot of bumps and the small earthquakes, um, large bumps, small earthquake has one bump. Okay, so the number of bumps or sub-event grows with earthquake size. This x-axis here is showing you the size of the main event, the main shock, and these are the number of sub-events. Uh, you can see that with growing size, this is Tohoku, and by all means, an outlier for everybody to study earthquakes, but the biggest one is the outlier. But if you look at the ensemble of, of, of um, number of sub-events, you have a growing number of sub-events. So bigger earthquakes are more complex because they have more sub-events. However, it's not, we don't have a log scale here. And so actually the size of the sub-events grows also with the size of the earthquake. And that was really the breakthrough, is that we don't have a, a characteristic bump that tells us a characteristic length scale in the earth. Instead, the earthquake dynamics has this interesting and intrinsic uh, length scale that is characteristic to the earthquake size. All of these dots are a sub-event that has a size shown here in log scale, uh, attached to the size of the main earthquake shown here. These lines, this is a one-to-one -one line, saying the sub-event here has the same size as its uh, master earthquake, in which case this earthquake probably only has one sub-event to form it. This line here is showing you that earthquakes would have about 100 bumps, 100 sub-events to form the earthquake. And so what you can see, it, it is not an infinite amount. The sub-events don't have the same size. These events actually grow with earthquake magnitude. And so what was interesting, the color scale is representing the uh, distribution. And so these small events tend to have mostly one, one main uh, sub-event versus the large event have a lot more. And, and the, the, if you were to draw kind of a scaling, it's not one-to-one, -one, but it's a very strong scaling. So that means in terms of structure of the earthquake, a small event has a small bump, and the big event has a big bump at the beginning. So let's say you measure this. You can tell crudely what size of the earthquake it is, which is fine, the earthquake is done. But if you go to those larger magnitudes, if you measure this first bump, then you can predict or estimate the final size of the event. Without the earthquake, the earthquake is not done yet. You're just making an inference based on this organization of the, of the, the, the seismic signal. And so we, we, we took this independent data set. We, we looked at this recent Indonesia earthquake in, in 2018, 7.5. Uh, it was large. It was not really on a map fault per se. It was not in really on the plate boundary. It's one of those earthquakes that just tell us, we don't know much. They're not just on plate boundaries. Earthquake happen in unforeseen places, so we can't really just pray the earthquake tomorrow, but these, these are the earthquakes that remind us how young our field is. So the top function is showing you the same, what would be a P wave, as a function of time. And then um, we fitted all these Gaussian functions shown in this uh, dashed line. And at the bottom, this is a one of our attempts to say what would be, given this bump, our estimate of the magnitude of the final earthquake. This green line is showing you the past magnitude. This says, if I integrate here, this, I had a small earthquake shown here, and if I go on, a lot of the earthquake has gone, and so by the end of the day, the magnitude is what, whatever is gone until here. And so these dots are showing you with some kind of refinements that we do a long, a long time, that my, our first estimate here is within a few seconds of the earthquake, we are not far off the final magnitude. Although the earthquake has an really gone yet. Um, and so that was quite, quite exciting. It's not this nucleation phase where we can see this A seismic slip. Uh, we don't wait for the end of the earthquake. We're kind of like this nice warning of about, you know, 40 seconds possibly of warning ahead. So we, we're close to a minute's more warning. And um, so to give you a sense of how earthquake early warning works today, 
This is the one that is uh, being estimated for Japan. GMA is a Japanese meteorological agency. This stands for Earthquake Early Warning System, study from Minsan and others. And they looked at uh, a few Japanese earthquakes with those uh, STF stands for that function I was showing you earlier. These are magnitude of the main earthquake, and these are time, basically rupture time of the earthquake. So these are smaller earthquakes, they're shorter. And these are the functions I was showing you, a green one, this is a black one. This was a large earthquake, magnitude nine. This was a magnitude seven, magnitude 6.9. And what they're showing you here is the, the, um, basically the estimate of the earthquake early warning system there in Japan. So during the Tohoku earthquake, they waited about 20 seconds after the earthquake started to issue a first magnitude estimate. They soon realized that the amplitude was big and so it was a larger earthquake. So they estimated within 25 seconds it was a magnitude seven. And then as time goes, you get more data, you refine your estimate. Their final estimate was really off by one order of magnitude, which is equivalent to a 30 times difference in, in size of earthquakes. Um, and th this is showing you the function before, this is the true size of the earthquake. So I was telling you we failed at re-predicting this Tohoku earthquake. But if we were to look at all the earthquakes, I'm just showing you dots of where our prediction would be in time. And we really would be a lot faster than current system if this were implemented in an um, in earthquake. And so we looked at many events. We have 3,000 of those. And we made this figure that shows relative to uh, duration time of the earthquake. These are all the sub events or bumps estimated uh, magnitude for the last earthquake, the large one. And what we found is usually between 10, between 10 and 20% at the beginning of the earthquake, we can tell what magnitude it is. It has some um, nice features to it. I'm happy to talk about it. It has to do with the structure of the sub-events. But the bottom line is that we can predict the magnitude before it stops. But it's not about, it, it was not really fancy. It was just really uh, finding a pattern in the complexity of earthquakes. So these types of savings could be between tens and 30 seconds of saving of uh, magnitude, which, which, uh, which is quite significant. So I wanted to show you a new perspective on what uh, machine learning or buzzword being uh, artificial intelligence could do for predicting earthquakes. Um, these are, we're gonna turn it back into lab quakes, which predicts very nicely already um, what earthquakes will look like. But I think there's a lot of hope to use those methods to really try to find patterns in the current data set that we have. Um, and let's say that we currently work, um, you know, 10, 20 terabytes data set is normal, especially for my postdoc, who overloaded the Harvard cluster last night. <laughs> we have many terabytes of data. So we have a lot of data to, to, to look at. So this study is showing you um, that they were able to predict when the next earthquake or lab quake would happen just by looking at these ambient vibrations. And so um, in lab, you can replicate the earthquake cycle a lot faster. So you have multiple earthquakes. And I was showing you the Alpine fault. It's every 300 years. We don't have 300 years of seismograms. Um, and so you can kind of speed up this, this process and look, at, um, and look at those patterns for the earthquake cycle. So what they found is looking at these ambient vibrations is when the earthquake happened here, the stress drops, the waves look like this, and then when the earthquake is close to failure, you may have some of those more impulsive events. But what was interesting is they managed to, uh, using this ambient time series, to predict the time to failure uh, through time here during the experiment. And so their prediction was shown in blue uh, with a random forest algorithm, and then what the experimental data was showing is, is shown in red. And these are the, uh, the validation part. And so it's, it's really stunning that even though it's not regular, these predictions were able to show you know, a weaker earthquake compared to a big earthquake. Uh, so I thought it was one of the most promising study from machine learning to predict earthquakes. In-house, um, our team at Harvard has been able to predict the location of aftershocks. And so I was telling you, we have the main shock and then we have many aftershocks, which is something we forget about. If your building is already shaken by the main one, you will have many more earthquakes to go. The building is going to have to 
deal with many more earthquakes in aftershocks. Um, and so what this study was uh, showing is that if you look at those um, black dots, the fault is showing at these um, yellow patches. The red is showing basically the change in stress uh, that you can predict from the slip that happened on the previous earthquake. And they worked with multiple earthquakes here. And what they found is that the traditional way of looking at where earthquake would be given a change of stress in the crust failed to predict many, many of the aftershocks. But instead, they found with a neural network that they could tease out a metric, a better metric to predict where aftershocks would be, um, which has to do with the stress invariance. Um, but basically, these approaches were successful at predicting the location of the next earthquake. And so this is short-term forecast. It's not saying years ahead we'll have an earthquake. It's saying we had an earthquake. We know there will be aftershock. And it's saying where the next aftershock could be. Um, other things that uh, machine learning has, has been really successful out in seismology is detecting those very weak, weak ground motions that are buried in seismic noise. And uh, we had uh, in-house a really good grad student, Thibaut Perrol, um, that uh, one, was one of the first to use a deep neural network to detect earthquakes. And um, we worked in Oklahoma. We worked on the data set that already had a few thousand events, but we were able to detect uh, something like 20 times more events. And these are shown here with those beautiful S wave and P waves, um, all the lines, and we have about you know, hundreds and hundreds of those events that we can look at the waveforms and say, ha, actually there was an earthquake, we just hadn't detected it with natural and more established methods. Um, and so, so in terms of, of, of prediction, I think there's a lot of hope with the new methods and mostly the past recording of, of data where we can put, potentially tease out some of these short-term short -term forecasts. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you.